Father, we do turn our eyes to you today. Please guide our thoughts and our minds in the following moments that we would turn to you, that we would understand you, and Lord, that your spirit would speak to us and encourage us with truth, and Lord, compel us to obey your word. Lord, we pray that is true for all of us in this room. We pray it is true especially for those who don't know you. Pray that your spirit would move in them even as I speak these words. Convict them of sin and righteousness and judgment. Cause them to love you. Compel them to turn their eyes to you in repentance and faith. All of us need this, and so we ask for it in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, such a beautiful day, and so great to be with you all. We're so privileged to open our Bibles to the first epistle of Peter. If you've been with us, you know that we have just begun our study of this magnificent book, First Peter, so, so applicable to those of us who are his elect exiles, people who are not of this world, whose home is not here but in heaven, and we who are here only temporarily, we have to figure out How do we live life in this world? How do we glorify God in the midst of a corrupt and crooked world? How do we relate to the world around us and the people and the family and the friends? How do we love our neighbors who are a part of that world? How do we find peace? How do we endure when the curse of this old world weighs down on us? How do we deal with government and everything else? How do we live in this world? That's the fundamental answer that Peter is giving us in this epistle. And what Peter wants to do in this first chapter is motivate us to holy living, to holiness. And he's going to do that by showing us this inexpressible joy and privilege it is to simply be God's people. He wants to fill us with joy, which is the best motivation for holiness, right? It's not... A hypocrit- hypocritical motivation, right? We're not just trying to compete with other people so that we can pat ourselves on the back. That's not a good motivation to holiness. Our motivation to holiness should be God's glory and our joy and privilege it is to serve a wonderful and true God. That is why we should pursue living in line with His precepts and His principles. One of the things I have said from this pulpit, it's not novel to me, not unique to me, many pastors and preachers and theologians have said this through the years, is that every single Christian should prepare their hearts and prepare in their hearts a theology of suffering. You have suffered, or perhaps you're suffering right now, or you're going to soon suffer. This world, while it is still under this curse, is indeed a place of suffering. You're going to have hardship. That hardship may be something that's caused by someone else, maybe someone near like a family member or a spouse, or maybe someone else in government way beyond your reach. It may be evil that you suffer that you've brought about on yourself, right? That's a lot of evil we suffer is stuff we've done to ourselves, the repercussions of our own wrongdoing or poor decisions. And sometimes we suffer just naturally, right? We face this nature. Aging is a form of suffering. You suffer sickness and illness, or perhaps you suffer from some sort of accident. It really was no one's fault but some sort of accident, and there is suffering. This is the broken world we live in. It's imposing its brokenness and corruption into our lives. And so I believe every Christian ought to develop in their heart a doctrine of suffering. How can I endure? How should I understand what the Bible says about suffering and how I'm to endure and how I'm to persevere? What does the Bible say about suffering? What resources, what passages of Scripture should I go to when I'm struggling and when I'm suffering? 
Now, I think the passage today really has a message to help us develop our doctrine of suffering, a theology of suffering. In fact, because of suffering is a part of every one of us, elect exiles, this is a major theme in the book of First Peter. Suffering, how are we going to suffer? It helps us develop our own spiritual readiness. I think one of the things that will help us, and we're going to see this specifically today, is to understand the joy and privilege it is to persevere through hardship. The truth, the truth that we can indeed find joy even though we are facing great hardship. Who faced the greatest hardship of all? Who faced the greatest suffering of all? It was Jesus Christ, and He did it, the author of Hebrews says, for the joy set before Him. So there was an understanding of joy that helped Jesus suffer even in His tears and anguish, and that's the kind of joy that we ought to learn, that we ought to learn to put into our hearts. It's a big part of our theology of suffering is learning to find joy in our perseverance. Jesus not only modeled it in His crucifixion, spoken of there in Hebrews, but Jesus also said this is indeed the way of the cross. I mean, you're going to, if you're going to follow after me, you're going to take up your cross. And you're going to need to deny yourself. You will suffer for the cause of Christ. Paul called this the fellowship of His sufferings. You join in the sufferings of Jesus, Philippians 4.13. Paul would later tell the Corinthians that the joy of the abundance of God's comfort can only be found in the context of suffering. In other words, you will not experience the value and joy of God's comfort unless you're first suffering. Of course, Peter would say later here in 1 Peter that we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ, similar to Paul. And as we do that, Peter would say, we ought to keep on rejoicing. This is exactly the framework, the language that he uses in our passage of today. He starts and ends our section that we're going to look at today with the idea of persevering with joy. It says we ought to rejoice, verse 6, and he ends there in verse 10, we ought to rejoice with joy inexpressible in spite of all of our suffering. We're supposed to be rejoicing. This is, if you were here last week, this is the second pillar of Christian joy. If Peter is trying to set up joy as the foundation of good works, of holy living, this is the second idea. The first one was the hope, that living hope that abides within us by God's Spirit. And the second pillar is joy in perseverance, joy through suffering. This abundant joy will then turn and fuel our good works in this present world. Well, let me read to you our text, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to... I'm just going to go to the 9... Follow along as I read aloud. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not see Him, now see Him. You believe in Him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. This morning, as we look at this passage, I do want to ask at least part in part about the question of evil. Every religion every world view, every system of seeing the world and understanding the world, every one of these have uh, some sort of explanation of why there is evil. Where does evil come from? What's the purpose of evil? Sometimes more in a more colloquial way, we say, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there evil in this world? Now, how does the Bible answer that question? Why do bad things happen to good people? Of course, the first answer to that question is that only happened once, and he volunteered for it. 
But today I'm not going to get to all the answers that the Bible provides for why there is evil. But I am going to mention what's relevant to our text. There's at least one reason, and the one reason here is that evil and suffering and difficulty in your life forces you to draw near to God. It forces you to reach over and dust off your Bible and start reading. It forces you to pray like you've never prayed before. It forces you to draw near to God. And as you draw near to God in your difficulty, what you will find is that God in His comfort will strengthen you. And in that strength and in that comfort and in that faith that He is providing you as you draw near to Him, you find a joy that you've never found before. You find joy in perseverance. And that's the sort of the fundamental idea that everything Peter is saying here, every Everything I mentioned about Peter and Paul and Jesus, the foundation is that suffering drives you to God, it provides perseverance as you draw near to God, and that initiates joy. That's the line of reasoning. Suffering calls us to perseverance, perseverance calls us to rely on Christ, to study Him, to know Him, which is our supreme joy. That is why we can have joy in perseverance. Well, to help us persevere with joy, to help us discover joy as we persevere. Peter invoked five ideas in this text that I can identify. Five ideas. I've summarized each idea with a single word. What are these? Number one, you may want to write this down, brevity. Verse 6. Did you notice this? In this you rejoice, though now for a little while... It is necessary you have been grieved by various trials. Brevity meaning shortness in regard to time. It's related to the word brief. You all know who John Newton is. Uh, If you don't know who he is, you know what song he wrote. He was a wicked man, a sailor, and then became a slave trader. And he was eventually captured and made a slave himself and traded around. He became a slave. After he escaped and got back to England, he gave his life to Christ. Eventually, he became a pastor and a poet and a hymn writer, and he, of course, wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton put forward a little parable in one of his sermons about the brevity of suffering. Let me read this to you. He says, "'As suppose a man was going to New York to take possession of a large estate, and his carriage should break down a mile before he got to the city, which obliged him to walk the rest of the way. What a fool we should think of him if we saw him wringing his hands and blubbering out all the remaining mile, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken. You understand the idea behind this illustration? The purpose is to bring into focus by way of exaggeration the time of suffering on earth and the folly it is to sink into depression and faithlessness. If you were driving to town to receive a billion dollars and you had a flat tire just near where it was where you were to pick up the money, you would probably laugh it off. You'd be a fool to be downtrodden and depressed. Why? Because the loss of that tire compared to the immediacy and glory and joy of that inheritance pales in comparison. Any trouble should seem infinitely insignificant if we can truly appreciate the reality of eternity. What is our inheritance? The fact of the matter is very few of us suffer for very long. I mean, some of you, maybe you've suffered some ailment, some sickness. My mom suffered cancer for nine years before she passed away. But even then, it wasn't all suffering. There were joys. There was happiness. There was relief from pain. There was remission a couple of times. It wasn't just perpetual torture and misery. But let's just for argument's sake say that there is an individual, hypothetically, who suffers torture and frustration their entire life. Even if that's the case, you have to remember your life is but a blip compared to 
eternal bliss. It's brief, our time on earth, nothing compared to eternity. So short, it's almost laughable. And yet we complain when life gets a little bit difficult. Peter's objective is to invoke this idea just for a little while. The fact of the matter is, some of the people to whom he is writing, some of these people will be tortured and put in prison and die there. And he knew that. And yet he said, it's just a little while. Your time on earth is brief compared to eternity. You can find joy. You can find joy because this time is brief. This is a brief time. Glory is right around the corner. Your inheritance is right there. There is no reason to be depressed, no reason to get down as though this is your whole existence. It's all about suffering. No, your eternal existence is bliss. I would often tell myself in seminary, I, I, early in seminary, trying to figure out who I uh, was and what I was doing, I, I was working three jobs at one point and going to seminary. And I lived two hours away from seminary. I sold ADT security systems. I, uh, on the weekends, if I had time, I would work for a clothier that would sell men's suits. And I was planning a church. And I would drive down two hours away to seminary and drive back and drive down and drive back. I wore that highway out, I-65. I came up with a little saying to help me in that era, and it was, I can do anything for one semester. I can live off no sleep for one semester. It's a short amount of time. I can do anything. And the truth is, you can do a lot more than you think you can. You can do anything for a short lifetime. Most of us won't suffer our whole lives. Most of us in this room will not have a lifetime of suffering. Most of us, our suffering will be brief in spurts. It'll come and go. It's brief. Even if you are suffering your whole life, it's brief. It's short in comparison to eternal joy. By Christ, you can do anything for this brief lifetime and then eternal bliss. Brevity. That's the first idea that Peter invokes the second is in that same verse, the very next phrase. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Second word is necessity. The phrase in the original is a day on. It gives us the idea that our suffering is not out from under the sovereign purposes and plan of God. If you have the NIV, it says you had to suffer. The idea is that sufferings that we experience are not the result of impersonal, accidental forces of nature or evil people acting, but rather they're planned out by a loving God. My dad's favorite hymn is Like a River Glorious. I think it's in the third verse. It says, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. Isn't that good? Whatever you're going through is a part of God's sovereign plan. It is not out of His control. He knows exactly what's happening to you every minute. In fact, He knows more about what's happening to you than you know what's happening to you. He knows everything. It's all a part of His plan traced on your dial. This little phrase if necessary, is one reason why some scholars think that Peter wrote the book of Hebrews. You probably know that we're not sure which apostle was in charge of the writing or wrote or the, the book of Hebrews. Uh, the early church acknowledged that it was apostolic, but they didn't do us a favor by telling us who it was from, so there's always debates. So some people say the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is Pauline. There's too many Old Testament references. This had to be written by a former Pharisee, someone who really knows the Old Testament and wants to settle these things. Others say it's Petrine. Why? Because this passage here, Peter sounds a lot like Hebrews 12, and you're reading about hardship and difficulty, that ultimately it's all from a loving God. In fact, let me read to you. Hebrews 12, 3 to 11, very familiar text. I want to read it just by way of encouragement. 
Incidentally, there was a time when I was going through a really difficult moment in college, and I went to a church that I'd never been before. It was a friend's church, and the pastor had memorized Hebrews 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and he stood up and just quoted it for the church for a sermon. Don't ever expect that from me. <laughs> but it was passages like this that really brought encouragement to my heart. So be encouraged as I, listen, as I read this. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him, for the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son whom He received. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us, us for our good, that we may share in His holiness." For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Well, all of this is to highlight the necessity of suffering. God is more interested in your personal holiness than your physical healing. He's more interested in your Christ-likeness than your comfort in life. Receive it for what it is, God's love. It is necessary. Okay, third idea that Peter invoked to help us suffer with joy as we persevere is the idea of purpose. Verse 7, so that, this is the word of purpose, right? That phrase, so that, why do we grieve? Why do we suffer? Here's the reason. I would say not the whole reason. The Bible gives, again, a much more complicated idea and and deep idea of suffering and evil, but this is part of the reason, and really I would say the main purpose, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, and speaking of your faith, he says, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Suffering functions as a crucible for faith. You guys know what a crucible is. It's that container, and they put chunks of metal into it, and they heat it up, and it turns into liquid, this red liquid. You've seen this on videos, I'm sure. And then the the smelter scrapes off the impurities. It's sometimes called dross or slag. He scrapes it off. And then he repeats this process over and over until it becomes more and more pure. 10 karat gold, 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold, 22 karat gold, and finally, no perceivable impurities, 24 karat gold. He heats it over and over and over until there is purity. This is what Peter is saying. Suffering is the crucible for your faith. It purifies your faith. And the wonderful reality is that we are one of God's children. Here, God, by His Spirit, through His power, through His Word, provides us faith. Remember what it says. Look back at verse 5. You who by God's power are being guarded through faith. In other words, as you live this life, God guards you by providing powerful, His power, through faith. He provides you faith as you suffer, as you are in the crucible. As things get harder and hotter and more difficult, He continues, as, your, as His child, He continues to provide you the faith you need. So God not only purposes suffering, He provides the faith to persevere. Let me say that again. God not only purposes suffering, He also provides the faith 
to persevere. And that faith grows ever and ever purer. And just think of the chain of events. God elects, God calls, God justifies, God purposes difficulty, and He provides the faith so that you become more and more pure as you persevere. And in the end, He gets all the glory for this. All to the praise and glory and honor revealed at the end, it says, revelation of Jesus Christ. This, this idea is actually uh, notated in the book of Revelation. We have uh, the 24 elders who sort of represent all of the saints for all of time, the, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles, and they, they come before the throne. Revelation chapter 4, verse 9, and whenever the living creatures give glory, uh, glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever. They cast their crowns. These are the victor's crowns. These are the ones that finish the marathon. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We will come to the end having been the throughput, the funnel through which God ex exalts Himself by giving you faith by providing you what you need while you're suffering. And at the end, you realize this, and you say, I give you all the glory. Any victory that I have is ultimately because, it, God, it was you by your Spirit working in me all along. The purpose of your suffering is ultimately to express this wonderful chain of blessings. That God chooses you and blesses you, and He fills you with faith. Not just at the moment for salvation, He fills you with faith as you, even as you suffer. It's what animates us, it's what encourages us, it motivates us to persevere in our faith. We glorify God for those victories even at the end of the day. That's the purpose of our suffering, to glorify God. Fourth idea that Peter invoked about our suffering, brevity, necessity, purpose, number four, presence. Verse 8 is a familiar text. You've been a Christian very long. You've heard this. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not, do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Peter is saying, folks, suffering folks, you of all people are aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit, that God's Spirit is with you. Though you go to the ends of the earth, He's there. In dungeon, He's there. He's with you, though you don't even see Him. Before I even get to the exegesis of the, this text, short exegesis, let's just do this exercise in our minds. Just think with me the plain words of this text. I've not seen Him. You and I were not there. We were not there when Jesus lived on this earth. I've not seen Him. You've not seen Him. I have a reliable testimony, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit uses the testimony that He inspired to, to make Himself known to us. So the Holy Spirit makes Himself known to us, His presence. He's with me, though I've not even seen Him. I do not see Him now. Despite what some people may say, we should not hunt for visible or audible, audible manifestations of Jesus. Rather, we depend on the Word of God, which is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And as we read that, we hear the Spirit speaking to us. We're reading the Bible, and it is God speaking. And His presence is felt with us. And as a result, I rejoice with joy that's inexpressible, filled with glory. Wouldn't this be a good verse to memorize? In your establishing your doctrine of suffering... Memorize this verse. Think about this verse because there's going to be times that you will need to be aware of His presence with you. God is with me no matter where I go, no matter where I am. He's here with me. Peter's readers were located in Asia Minor. They had never seen Jesus uh, other than a, a very quick trip up into what we would call Lebanon. Jesus never left Israel. He stayed right there, very close. 
And uh, so these people, none of them had ever seen Jesus. None of them had been around Jesus. All they had was apostolic testimony, which is spirit-inspired testimony. The important to note here, Peter is not issuing a command. I want you to put an asterisk by this idea. He's not saying, even though you don't see him, you better love him or else. No, that's not a good interpretation. The agape there is the indicative. He's commending them. You know he's with you, even though you don't see him. Though you go through hardship, though you suffer many things, you know he's with you. You're not overcome with depression and gloom. Rather, you're filled with love for Jesus because you know He's with you, even a man that you've only heard about and read about. This is John 20, right? I mean, this is John chapter 20, you know, eight days after the resurrection. There's old Thomas. He's still sort of the, the skeptic of the crowd, and he's still wondering if Jesus had really been raised. Jesus came to them in. He walked right up to Thomas and showed him his scars, let him even touch them. Verse 28 of John 20, Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. These people in 1 Peter are the people to whom Jesus was referring. And guess what? You are too. And I am too. Jesus knew that most Christians will not, until the end, will not get to see Jesus or know Him on a personal, physical level. But we believe Him, and we love Him, and we know Him because the Spirit is in us speaking to us. Well, that's Peter's point. True believers who suffer are not dashed on the rocks of unbelief and doubt in their troubles. No, they're exalted in their hearts, knowing that the person that they can't even see is there with them, and He's comforting them. They're exalted. Now read verse 9 with me. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Number five, reward. The final idea that Peter invokes, reward. Now, at first glance, it seems that Peter is simply talking about what he did earlier when he talked about the end, right? Salvation as a future thing. Salvation as the end of time when we are declared acquitted in that eternal courtroom and we are granted eternal bliss, given new bodies. And I don't think that's outside of the scope of Peter. I certainly believe he, he does have that in mind. I do think this is true about what he's saying. Essentially, after enduring a lifetime, there is that reward in the end. But I don't think that's all that Peter means when he says obtaining salvation of your souls. First of all, because that verb obtaining, it's in the present middle. So you could even say what you are obtaining. Furthermore, it's written parallel to the verb above it that you are rejoicing. We're going to close with this. The reason I point this out is because Peter's language is not saying, hey, as a Christian, you're going to live this dry, miserable, sorry life full of suffering and misery. Suck it up. Don't complain. Stop belly aching. You're going to have a reward in the end. No, what he's saying is, as you fill your heart with all these ideas, brevity, hardship, the necessity of hardship, the purpose of your difficulty, the constant presence of Christ, as you fill your mind and heart, guess what? You experience that reward even now. You experience that joy even now. That's why David prayed as he confessed his sin and going back into fellowship with God, return to me the joy of your salvation. It's something he experienced presently on earth. He knew that here on this earth, he can enjoy this joy inexpressible, this reward, even as he's suffering. Probably have a few marathon runners among us. First thing I would say to you is go see a psychiatrist. 
Uh, but you know, as a marathon runner, there is joy even while you're running the marathon. It's, it, yes, the supreme joy, the best joy, is when you break the tape at the end. But you experience elation and joy and happiness. Yes, there's moments of hardship and difficulty, and you think, I'm going to give up. But there are moments of joy, even as you run that marathon and torture yourself for the glory of God. You know there's joy, and there's joy in this earth. We get to experience maybe not the fullness of the reward that God has for us, but even on this earth, as we run this marathon, we get to experience joy that's inexpressible. And we get to experience that even as we persevere through hardship. Like I said, I think this is central to Peter's whole argument here. We find joy as we persevere. Much of your joy cannot come from the primrose path of ease and comfort. And I would say most of your joy can't come from that. Most of your joy will come in hardship and suffering. Why? Because you are drawing near to God and persevering through it. Well, let's pray that God grants us that faith and perseverance. Father... We thank you for passages like this. So many of us, even in this room, are suffering in these moments. Maybe they're suffering through family difficulties, divorce, problems with children. Maybe they're suffering problems that are physical in nature. Maybe things in their mind or their heart. Maybe physical things like cancer, and Lord, others of us are suffering for just the repercussions of our own poor decision-making, our own sins, and Lord, we thank You that You have given us passages such as this to inform our doctrine, our theology of suffering, that we can find joy in this perseverance. Help us find this joy. Lord, I firmly believe that that joy cannot be fully found unless we are in Christ. And so for those who don't know Christ, bring that reality to their minds. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would awaken their hearts, awaken their souls to the reality of the gospel. Grant them faith to believe and repentance to follow Christ. All of us need to continue in that faith. And we thank you, even as we've studied today, that you continue to provide us that faith as we live this life. Help us in these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, stand with me. And let me read a benediction for us. Now may we go with the joyful knowledge that God will supply every need of yours according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen.